Hey everyone, this is John, and I'm going to seek to address in this talk the flawed logic and the superficial reasoning of several different arguments regarding the Mandela effect. The arguments that I will seek to address are that those that are suggesting that the Bible is being supernaturally changed are raising up their memories above the authority of Scripture. That we are essentially choosing something that is very fallible, the human memory, over something that is very infallible, the scriptures. It's argued that no one should take the opinion of someone on a YouTube channel over the sure foundation of the apostles and Jesus Christ. Another similar argument is that by suggesting that the Bible is changing, we are exalting the power of the devil over the power of God. So let me just first say that many of the people offering these arguments do claim to have a testimony for Christ. They're raising these arguments because, you know, they're contending for the faith. They are apologists for the truth. So they really are operating out of a zeal for God's honor. And for that, I do respect them. Having said that, I am compelled to examine their concerns to really determine if there's any validity to what they're saying. Because if there is, I'll change how I'm addressing this topic. But my preliminary analysis of their arguments leads me to believe that they have not really thought through what they're saying before they've said it. It is true that the Bible makes a claim on men's souls and presents itself as the final authority in the earth regarding the express nature, the character, the will of God, and all things pertaining to God. And we are not to take the advice or the direction of angels over the word of God, or apparitions, or voices, or dreams, or certainly other religions, and certainly the fallible memory of humans should never be considered to be a more certain communication medium than the written scriptures. And nowhere else in the Bible do we see this more clearly delineated than in Luke 16. So in this real account, we learn of a rich man who died and immediately found himself in a place other than heaven, it says that he was in torment in the flames. And in this account, we're told that this rich man somehow was able to communicate with Abraham across a great chasm. Abraham informed him that he was not able to cross the chasm and he would have to remain where he was. Well, the rich man continued asking Abraham to let him out, but when all his answers had been exhausted, he finally resorted to asking Abraham for a favor. For those who he knew were still in his house and is alive. So he asked Abraham to send Lazarus from the dead back to earth to his house to warn his brothers so they would not come to this place of torment. But this is the answer that he received from Abraham. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, that's the scriptures, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So we are taught clearly that someone <clears throat> rising from the dead to tell you something about God is not as authoritative as the scriptures themselves telling you. And so the argument that we hear goes something like this. If God has placed such a high premium on the trustworthiness of scripture. <clears throat> if God has invested the scriptures with such an exalted responsibility to deliver accurately who God is and what he requires of men, then surely it is the height of arrogance of a man to come along and make the claim that the scriptures have been changed based on his memory, therefore no longer reliable to be trusted. Now, I would be the first to agree with this position if it wasn't for one thing. And that is the fact that the Bible is changing. <clears throat> so as a result, <clears throat> I am compelled to look more closely at what the Bible is really saying about inerrancy and not just take the word of people that have stood before me as authority figures. I then have to look at these arguments that are being levied against us and try to provide some greater understanding of how these things can be reconciled. So the first distinction I would make is to understand the difference between immutability and inerrancy. 
Immutability basically means that which has been said shall come to pass. And biblical inerrancy is the belief that the Bible is without error or fault in all of its teaching, or at least that scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that's contrary to fact. The books of scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error, the truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation. So some argue further that the original texts have been perfectly preserved and passed down through time. This is known as providential preservation or the doctrine of the preservation of scripture. And so it's important to note that just because I or others claim that the Bible is changing does not mean that I no longer believe that the original manuscripts are no longer immutable. In other words, I do believe that everything that was spoken in the original autographs and then recorded and preserved up until the time that the Bible began to change is immutable and inspired, and it will come to pass. Therefore, I am in alignment with the teaching of Luke 16, and I do continue to hold the scriptures as they were given to the original authors in the highest esteem. But that, however, is where we part. And there I break with those who maintain that the scriptures are still inerrant to the original autographs and that they have been properly preserved up until the present. This is clearly not the case, as I and others have shown in numerous other videos. I'm simply pointing out that my memory alerted me to the fact that an end times prophecy is being fulfilled. And by doing so, we're seeking to preserve the original message that was inspired and we're avoiding the trap of beginning to comply or learn from certain scriptures that are no longer inspired by God. I'm essentially holding to the authority of scripture above the illusion of the current reality. It is also important to note that it's not the same to disobey the known will of God as opposed to suggesting that the scriptures that teach the will of God are changing supernaturally. I've not withdrawn my allegiance or my obedience from God. If anything, it's become stronger. The Bible used to say, thou shalt not murder. Now it says, thou shalt not kill. If we were to follow the scripture as it is and ignore our God-given memory, we would all have to become vegetarians. So the accusation that I'm raising my memory over the authority of scripture is totally unfounded. What's actually happening is the opposite. Thanks to my memory alerting me, I've been able to now confirm this conspiracy with six other forms of proof, five of which have nothing to do with memory and come reluctantly to the decision that the Bible is changing. Now this then forced me to re-examine the long-held doctrine of inerrancy. And after considering the ramifications of this phenomena, I and others realized that we would have to adapt to an entirely new dispensation within the church age. Look, it's either happening or it isn't. And if it is happening, then the statement I just made is true. We are now forced to do things like focusing on scriptures that we vividly remember, so we're not led astray, relying on the consensus within the community to try to get a bearing, and then relying on a sort of hybrid oral tradition where we remember the scriptures, we study the scriptures, but we also begin to rely on one another to confirm what we know to be true about God. We have been forced to shift our emphasis away from the scriptures as it has been in the past, since the long held moorings of an intact canon of scriptures are no longer available, we're also compelled to rely more heavily on the Holy Spirit and his willingness and ability to communicate, to instruct and to guide us. The only reason someone would consider all of this blasphemy is because they would just deny the changes are happening. But if God was to remove the blinders from your eyes, you would be forced to establish a similar response to yourself. Therefore, it's not us who acts wickedly by raising up our memories above the authority of scripture. It is in truth the Mandela effect denier who raises up their unbiblical human reasonings above the scripture. It's you that should be ashamed of yourselves and not us. Would you consider that God commands his people to remember 
over 30 times in the Bible, it seems really silly to suggest that we shouldn't rely on our memories, as we're told by so many Mandela effect deniers. They seem to know something about the human memory that God hasn't figured out yet. It illustrates the absurdity of this assertion. Let me give you some observations on memory from Scripture. In this and other passages, God seems to place a significant reliance upon the reliability of long-term memory. In 1 Chronicles 16:15. We hear, remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. By commanding his followers to remember his covenant forever and his commandment to a thousand generations, he does seem to be clearly providing a biblical endorsement that is in direct contradiction to the insinuation that human memory is untrustworthy. How else would it be possible for an individual to remember his covenant forever? Clearly, this passage is not speaking of writing it down, for there are other passages that do give that direction. This is clearly an instruction to use the faculty of memory, and specifically long-term memory, to store information over long periods of time and then retrieve it when necessary. This observation gives significant credibility to be able to easily refute the argument <clears throat> that the use of memory to come to any important conclusion is completely flawed. The Bible is clearly teaching here that memory is reliable and therefore can be trusted to make important decisions. Furthermore, Deuteronomy 32.7 says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. So <clears throat> this second passage clearly instructs the follower to remember things that happened a long time ago. How could God do that if it was so difficult for us? If most people would be unable to recall the things of old, why would God command us to do something he knew we were incapable of? What about Deuteronomy 6.12? It says, Then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, while the previous passage supports the idea that the memory is reliable, Deuteronomy 6 clearly seems to indicate that the memory is to be relied upon. And when you go to the concordance, when you look at the meaning of the term, take heed or beware, what you find is that it is an instruction to rely upon it. In other words, it is instruction to trust your memory. So the Mandela Effect denier is teaching that we should not trust our memory in direct contradiction to the clear teaching of Scripture. Furthermore, this term, take heed or beware, also puts forth the instruction for the believer to have a responsibility towards cultivating their memory, treating it with respect, in a sense. We see this in the fact that the word is translated preserved 21 times in the Bible. But the primary meaning is that we keep our memories close and we hold them with respect. We nurture them. We observe them. We mark them. We regard them. Not disregard them, which is what we're being told. So really, without any further elaboration with any of the other 28 passages that tell us to remember, these two passages seem to completely obliterate the argument that the memory is unreliable and should not be trusted. And those using it are, are arrogant. Those putting forth this lie need to repent openly and publicly, for their insolence. They need to stop pandering and proffering a false narrative to support their own position that's unbiblical. They need to stop aligning themselves with the enemy of God because by doing so, they make themselves the enemy of God. They're trying to push off their own naturalistic reasonings as doctrine. The use of memory to alert you to the advent of the supernatural Bible changes is not only warranted by God, it is expected by God. And those teaching otherwise either don't know their Bibles or they have no interest in actually coming to the truth. And so I submit there is no dishonor to God when someone concludes that their Bible has changed based on the experience that they have vivid memories of scriptures that no longer exist. So once again, 
The next argument that I would like to explore is similar to the first, but quite different at the same time. This argument states that by suggesting the Bible is changing, we are somehow exalting the power of the devil over the power of God. So in response to this, we find ourselves having to refute an argument which is really nothing more than sentimental, unbiblical platitudes that have nothing to do with a well-researched doctrinal position. Although this sounds very noble and honoring to God, it's clear that it has not been thought through very well before being uttered in public. To properly understand the inaccuracy of this argument, you must first seek to define what we are actually being accused of. The Bible change denier is suggesting that the devil's power is being elevated beyond what it actually is. This means they are insinuating that the devil is incapable of changing the Bible because his power is less than God's, but it also insinuates that God wouldn't allow it or is not powerful enough to stop it. So in answering this accusation, I would begin by pointing out that the Bible change denier without specifically saying it, is putting forth the idea, first of all, that God is greater than the devil. And of course, those suggesting the Bible is changing don't dispute this in any way. I certainly don't. We agree that God is greater than the devil in every way. God is infinite. The devil is a created being. The devil only operates to the level that God allows him. Furthermore, much of his authority over the earth and man has been vanquished by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, which places the devil in the category of a defeated foe. But the fact that God is greater than the devil in every way doesn't mean that God would not allow him to change the Bible. You're making the assumption that God would not allow the devil to change the Bible because he's more powerful than him, but this assumption is unbiblical. God allows evil that is inspired by the devil to have its way all the time without being interrupted by him. Do you not realize that God in his infinite wisdom allows free will in this realm? As a result, countless children go missing every year and have unimaginable things done to them until they are finally murdered. You say the devil doesn't have that much power or God wouldn't allow it, but in this example, the devil does have that much power, and God did allow it. I know you feel that the Bible being changed is different than my example because you feel that the Bible specifically teaches that the scriptures can't be changed, but it doesn't teach that. Do you not know that God allows free will so that endless wars bring death, destruction, and starvation to untold millions? How could you say that the devil does not have permission to wage war on God's people when the Bible specifically says that God grants it in the last days? Revelation 13 says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And then it says, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So when it says it was given him, you have to ask yourself, who is it referring to? Who is the one described here as giving? Of course, it was God. And who is he giving to? Well, we see that in verse 4 of Revelation 13. So they worshipped the dragon. And they worshipped the beast. That's who God is giving the power and the authority to. So, I hear this from Mandela Effect deniers all the time. The devil doesn't have that much power. <sighs> Additionally, there's no scriptures that say that God won't allow the devil to change the Bible. There are, however, passages that say that God will allow the devil to change the Bible. There are also passages that say that even if the Bible was under providential protection, that protection is now lifted and the end days will be marked by the famine of the word. It will be unavailable. It will be taken from the church. So you say the devil doesn't have that much power. God says it was given power to wage war. You say the devil doesn't have that much authority. God says, and it was given him to have authority. So although your heart's in the right place, it's merely human sediment that urges you to protect God's good name by running to his defense. 
But it's really a lot like Peter when he rebuked Jesus for saying he was going to the cross. Peter injected himself between Jesus and the will of God and he got his hand slapped. In the kingdom of heaven, the greatest amount of glory seems to be brought to God when saints refuse to break ranks with God in the midst of extreme suffering. Those that observe them are moved by the inner strength and are converted on the spot. They see something that they want and they're drawn to God by long suffering of the tortured saint. And this is exactly what God did what he did when Satan brought the accusation that Job only served God because God blessed him. God could have easily refused being baited into hurting one of his own to satisfy the twisted whim of Lucifer. And the natural mind would assume that that is what God should have done because Job was a righteous man. But in fact, he didn't refuse Lucifer's offer and felt it was a value to allow the devil to bring harm to a man that just received the most glowing accolades from God's own mouth just a moment before. So the Mandela effect and events like it, among other things, are actually designed by God to prove and purify his honor among his saints. It's God's way to allow evil to have its way to some degree because it gives his followers the opportunity to prove to all the hosts of heaven that God is worthy to receive our allegiance under any circumstances. And so Job blessed the Lord when his wife suggested that he should curse God and die. But Job said, oh no, shall we not receive good and evil from the hand of the Lord? Good answer. Good answer. The true saint refuses to disparage the Lord, no matter how excruciating the torture, how extended the duration of the suffering, or how unwarranted, as with Job, it might seem. The Mandela effect is, among other things, God's way to purify the bride and to separate the wheat from the chaff. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of another they will not follow. He's clearly allowing the voice of the stranger to begin speaking through what used to be the inerrant word of God. It is up to the saint to hear his voice and stop following the voice of the stranger. It is a test that the naysayer is failing. See, the profound and horrible ramifications of the corruption of the Bible would take a thousand scholars a thousand years to begin to explore. There are no words to describe how devastating and damaging and perilous it is to have this event taking place, but this is not proof that God has not allowed it. This is not proof that it's not happening. I hear this all the time. John, do you realize what you're saying is true? Well, I didn't create this universe. I did not establish the rules of engagement with God. Are you gonna brush this aside because it's a hard thing? It's God's way to test you, dear soul, to see if you know who he is. And if you will serve him in spite of your confusion and your bafflement about his doctrines. My prayer every day is, God, I accept your terms. God can be known, but he cannot be understood. He is without, his ways are without knowing. He is beyond your comprehension. And this event is irrefutable. See, your belief is that God is honored when Satan is shown to be defeated, limited, or incapable of operating in certain ways. And that day will come. But God's plan in the midst of this history is quite different from yours. Why didn't God tell Lucifer no when Lucifer asked permission to hurt Job? God gave Lucifer permission or power to first destroy his stuff and then later to hurt him physically. This was a man that walked with God. The story with Job and God is a clear example of how God does allow Satan to have certain access to this world and to mankind. And although God retains the final word on how far he can go, it is clear that God does have a purpose in allowing Satan to operate in some capacity. So you cannot just make blanket statements based on your own opinion that God wouldn't allow this and God wouldn't allow that. 
especially when we have scripture that specifically says God will allow the devil to change the Bible, Daniel 7.25 and Revelation 22.10. And we have innumerable examples of how God has allowed things to take place that would seem to elevate the perceived power of the devil. But it's not only the Bible that testifies against you, it's history itself. What you're saying can never happen has already happened. As an example, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taze Russell, printed the New World Translation, which rejects every major doctrine of the Bible. This has been in print for something like 34 years. So that's an example of where God seems to have allowed the devil to alter the Bible. Now, granted, in this case, it was accomplished using natural means, but the result is the same, a corrupted Bible that misrepresents God in circulation. You also have all of the different translations which come under a variety of accusations for leaving out passages, altering words, and all kinds of bastardization of the original manuscripts. So God has already allowed the Bible to be changed, dear soul. If what you're saying is true, then none of those things I just mentioned would ta have taken place. And so in conclusion, in my humble opinion, it is no affront to God if I conclude that the devil is changing scriptures to fulfill some nefarious plan. God has given him power and authority to do so. And he has given me my memory and commanded me to use it and to trust it and to rely upon it. And so who am I to say that the devil would not be permitted to change the Bible. Thank you.